Yeah, it's more than just the cobalt in the Congo. Uh, it's everything in the Congo. And it's more than cobalt in the Congo. Um, Carl Baker joins us, uh, a, what, a, a senior advisor, uh, I think, at the Pacific Forum. Well, uh, a long the time. Part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry about that, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk about cobalt in the Congo because it opens. It's like um, you know, it's like it's like Proust. You know, you you open the subject through the keyhole. And you look through and you see on the other side, so many issues, so many concerns, right, Carl? Yeah, and yet you don't even know what concerns you're looking for. Is it a concern? Uh, you know, that, that, I think that's the first question is how do we know it's a concern? What are we measure? What's our measurement? Is it because there's China and resources involved in the sentence? Is that, is that why it's a concern? Well, let's let's go to the New York Times and the Washington Post, yeah. who say, you know, we're in we're in a kind of kimchi lately because without realizing it, uh, we lost control of a big American um, mine, a mine uh, that uh, that produced uh, two thirds of the world's supply of cobalt. And a year or two ago, um, I think it was a year or two ago, uh, the Chinese bought it. And we didn't do anything to stop them, notwithstanding whistleblowers uh, with the State Department, you know, in Africa, and also the manager of the mine warned, uh, you know, the American government not to let the Chinese conclude the deal. But we didn't do anything despite that advice, and uh, they bought it and they own it, and they are actually uh, developing it. And it's, it is a huge project in the Congo. Uh, Tenki, T-E-N-K-E, is the name of the mine, or at least the first name. Um, and, um, and, and, and what's, I think, really catchy about this is that at the same time as uh, the Chinese are developing this mine and controlling two thirds of the world's supply of cobalt, which is necessary for batteries. By the way, the Chinese also have lithium now, too, out of the Congo, I think maybe out of the same mine. Um, you know, rare earths are all the rage. And um, at the same time as, uh, you know, the, uh, I think it's Ford Motor Company is putting in a trillion dollars for, um, um, you know, electric vehicles. And, and the Biden administration is putting in, mm, mm, I don't know, many tens of billions to develop, um, you know, the infrastructure for uh, charging stations all over the country. Uh, and 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 also providing um, incentives, you know, uh, tax incentives and the like, to encourage the American people to buy electric vehicles, all for the purpose of climate change, dealing with climate change. And at this very point in time, we we find that maybe we can't do that because we don't have the um, cobalt to build the batteries to build the cars. Is this a is this of no concern, Carl? Well, it depends. It, I mean, it, that's the easy answer. It depends. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if we had a good measure to determine what, what is important and what isn't, it would be much easier. In other words, if we had an economic policy that defined what strategic goods we really are concerned about, then, we, then I'd have an easy answer for you. I would say, yep, it's on that list. And this is what we need to do because it's on that list. So we need to do something. And that's what the, the problem is, is this, this New York Times article is like responding to your inbox. You know, it, it's, is there a policy? Then it's very easy to answer the inbox. If there's not, then everybody's scrambling around saying, what should we do? Should we, should we, should we ban all, all uh, aid to the Congo so that they come back? Or should we, you know, should we try to restrict uh, imports from China, cobalt from China. It's, I mean, it's not a problem if we can import cobalt from China, because that's that's who's going to that's who's going to own it. Because they do, they had two mines, and and just a little further clarification, there were two mines involved in the Congo. The first one yes, was right. bought at the end, right at the end of the Obama administration, and the second one was bought right at the end of the Trump administration. Right. I mean, I think that's a coincidence, but it also is reflective of part of the problem the United States has, is that we haven't been consistent in the administrations. So. The Obama administration didn't see it as a problem, and the Trump administration didn't see a problem for different reasons, I think. But nonetheless, you know, the, the different administrations are, are 
so interested in doing whatever the other one didn't do that we end up not having a good policy and not a clear guideline on how to react when we see things like this that are get, that's getting reported in the New York Times as something terrible because because of the facts you you, you mentioned, which you know are, are sort of summarized in in the article. So, I mean, China. It, I mean, if you want to, if you want some more numbers, China purchased 44% of electric vehicles in, in I think, 2019. So uh, that's a significant number. So they're interested in developing the electronic vehicle and the electronic vehicle battery market. And, and yeah, cobalt is, is an essential element, as, as is lithium and graphite and, and several other uh, what some people have referred to as conflict minerals. You know, and that's and that's sort of the rest of the story about those mines and McMoran's involvement in those mines is, you know, a couple of years ago, there was a lot of concern about what was called artisanal cobalt mining in those mines because cobalt, as, as you know, is a chemical and it's actually derived largely from copper and nickel. And so what you have to do is you have to, you have to basically chemically compose cobalt. And so what, what happened is nobody really saw much value in the stuff. And so local, local people were doing dangerous things and, and basically stealing stuff out of the, out of the mines and, and selling cobalt along the side of the road. If you remember in the a picture in, in the New York Times showed, showed these little booths selling cobalt along the side of the road. You know, so, so I mean, it was a business decision that was made by by the, the company, and they decided it wasn't it wasn't worth it, and so they sold the thing for what it seems like dirt cheap. Now that we suddenly recognize that in fact cobalt is a key element to uh, the the emerging economy, uh, the post fossil fuel economy, if you will. I, I keep thinking of the Flemish, uh, the Dutch master painters, who used co invented cobalt blue. Maybe they didn't invent it, and it came from cobalt. I mean, that's yeah. <laughs> they were Akamai about cobalt for a long time. They had no idea, but it was a nice blue. I really it was a nice color. color. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's funny. The Times said that in the uh, in the uh, in the Obama administration, Obama was consumed. And I quote: "Consumed with things going on in the Middle East." And in the Trump administration, he was consumed with avoiding. Um, remediation of climate change problems, and he didn't want to touch anything that had anything to do with climate change. And right. batteries, you know, are in that category. That's right. So he didn't want to do anything. And, you know, and the other thing is, and you pointed this out to me, is that when you have a democracy where the power ostensibly changes every four years and the administration changes and the, each guy wants to do something different than the last guy wanted to do, as you said, um, then you have changing policies and uh, those policies filter all through the government. And so you can have a, a, a viable policy on a given subject uh, in, in one four year term and then the next four year term it goes away. Um, and if, um, if Biden was sitting with Xi Jinping and he did a few days ago, Xi Jinping would say, you know, your democracy doesn't work. You guys can't stay on the same policy for more than four years. You're always changing policy and you can't do long term. I was always uh, impressed with how the Chinese looked ahead. They looked ahead for decades and generations, uh, even centuries, um, to try to fashion policies that would be sustainable over multiple lifetimes. And in this case, it's easy. If you make your mind up that you want to do electric vehicles or renewable energy in general, because batteries apply to all renewable energy sources mm -hmm. to, you know, contain, you know, to hold the charge, so to speak, um, then, you know, a long-term policy is, is really necessary. And so this goes beyond just developing a policy for clean energy, which we have not really done. Right. It, it goes to the question of, of finding a policy that will stay with us for more than four years. Yeah. And, and that's a, a broader economic policy. I, you know, I, I found a quote from Wen Jiao, Wen Jiao Bao. In the, in the 2010 state uh, report. And he said, we need to fully bring into play the superiority of the socialist system, which is efficient de decision-making, powerful organization, 
and concentration of resources to achieve big things in 2010. Uh, and, and that's what China, I think, is trying to do with buying copper mines in the Congo. You know, it's, it's an example of, of implementing that kind of policy. It's a long-term policy, and, and it's, a, it's a system that they believe is efficient in doing those kinds of big things. And it is, it's a huge, it's a huge undertaking. And, and I mean, the numbers, the numbers are sort of staggering at the amount of cobalt that they intend to mine out of those, out of those mines in the Congo. Now, having said that, uh, there are long ways from doing that. I mean, you know, the, the rest of the article pointed out that there's, there's people who are not very happy in the Congo about the promises for the infrastructure development that China has sort of done, but sort of not completed. And they're, they're concerned about some of the safety issues, which of course uh, the, the American company was always on the hot seat for that they were trying to maintain standards of, of, of mining that are, are almost impossible to maintain in places like that. And so, you know, so, so yeah, it's important, but you know, getting, getting through the keyhole here, I think what's, what's interesting about the article is it's a little bit of fear mongering by the by, the journalists about about the the strength of the Chinese system and the weakness of American policy responses, and and it, it, it's justifiably so, but it, it points out you know this whole notion now that we are moving into a cold war with China, and it points out a very important fact about this this emerging cold war. If you like the, if you like the term or not, doesn't really matter. The fact is, is that we are now in a stage of competition with China. And people reckon back to the days of competition with Russia or the, or the USSR, more accurately, in the old Cold War. The difference here is that there's an economic component that's very real and, and very important to understand the implications of that economic component. You know, when, when, we had the, when we had the Cold War with, with the USSR, we didn't really worry about that because we had a single policy. It was, the, it was the US's Cold War policy and there wasn't much difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. There wasn't, there wasn't a, a sort of drifting at the end of the administrations to allow things like sale of a critical element in a mine in, in the middle of Africa. That thing, those kind of things just wouldn't happen because we would never let down our guard from, from basically blocking all economic activity, any technology transfers into the USSR. Where with China, it's very easy to do because it's a business decision by McMoran because they couldn't afford to maintain the mine because they had stupidly invested in fossil fuels and had to, had to get rid of the debt. And, and China saw it as an opportunity, took it, and, and in, the, in the, the, the belief in free markets, the United States saw that as a, as a legitimate business deal without, without thinking through the, the strategic ramifications of it. Uh, you know, and so you know, what you have is you have this, this hugely integrated global economy. And so that's why this cold, if, if this is going to be a cold war, we really need to think hard about how we develop an economic policy in response to it. Because you can't simply say, we're gonna cut off China. You can't isolate the Chinese economy. We've, we've learned everything is so integrated. It's like every, every time you turn around, you see another case where, where the supply chain is, is all over the place. And, and China is quite often right in the middle of that supply chain for the United States. You know, it's with semiconductors, it's with, it's with rare earths, it's with, with all these different kinds of things that are, are essential to the new economy. You know, and so, yeah, Obama was, was fixated with the, the Middle East because that's the old fossil fuel days when that was the resource that everybody needed and wanted and knew was important to the industrial economies of, of the West. And so now we're moving into this new economy and we're moving into this new sense of competition, but the competition is so much different this time around because the Chinese have focused on the economic component and they've, they've understood that that economic integration is going to make it almost impossible for anybody to shut them off 
and and the the, the size of their economy is is so great that everybody is going to be fixated on remember the old saying sell one coke a day to everybody in china and you're going to have a successful business <laughs> or better <clears throat> or better well yeah okay but uh, they certainly have it's, it's clear to everyone that they have made a plan they have focused on rare earths. They've uh, focused on chips, um, and um, you know, given a few moves, uh, they will. I'm, I'm sorry to say, but they will have uh, control, if you will, and uh, I, I don't want to say monopoly, but at least some significant global control of these critical, mm, these critical things. And we won't. <clears throat> and you know, I'll, let me throw a proposition at you, and and see if you agree or, or not. They're winning. They're winning the competition because they can formulate policy to get hold of these things and then sell them to us and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And we're not doing that. I agree. Wow. And and what do you do about it? I mean, what, yes. what's what's the solution to it? Is is first of all, I think I mean there's there's a couple things. I mean, let's begin. By, by understanding the Chinese economy. I don't think we still agree on what the Chinese economy is. You know, there's, there's a lot of different ideas. Some people still believe that there's, there's a potential for reform, that China is going to join the liberal economic order and they're going to suddenly comply with, uh, with the WTO. And there's others who say, no, they're not. And, and it's impossible. You know, and then, there's, and then there's variations in between. So what do we call China? Is China, is China capitalist i mean in, in some ways in some ways it's 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 uh, the, the quote from Lin, from Wen Jiawao is quite similar to what lenin said back in the uh, 1920s when he was trying to develop the economy in in uh, the soviet union you know so what is the economy is it a, is it a, a state capitalism there's there's sort of a consensus that that's what it's starting to look like but then there's 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 still these these big corporations that uh, are are not really not really state owned. But there's crony capitalism. Uh, there's another that's another word that people have used on the negative side of, of China. There's another another uh, uh, scholar who talks about the party state capitalism. You know, and that the party is now steering the economy, and it it makes the decisions of what are the key what are the key aspects of the economy, and it's the one that shuts down uh, a company like Alibaba, who's trying to trying to go go into the markets. So, you know, I think that we first we need to decide what what we really are looking at in China. Well, it's a moving target, isn't it? Probably right now, the Alibaba is a good example, and 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 don't forget the tennis player that disappeared. Any celebrity, anybody who could have a following, anybody who competes for public attention in China is at risk because something is happening with Xi Jinping. Yes, I, I I agree that that, but it's it's more about it's more about the consolidation of part power around the party, and certainly Xi Jinping is 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 dominant because he's the head of the party. It's not so much his state capacity anymore. I think people realize that he's very much becoming the chairman rather than the president. You know, and you're starting to see that that shift a little bit. That that there's a recognition that 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 he really is the chairman. And and is interested in in promoting the party as as the the key guide guidance for for the state, which makes sense. And so you know maybe that's why uh, some people think that it's now the party state capitalism, but it's capitalism to serve the interests of the party first and foremost. Is but, this I asked you this the last time we were together. Is it necessary? Was it necessary to um, you know put the stranglehold on Hong Kong? Is it necessary to rattle chains around Taiwan and, and make viable threats against Taiwan, take it over? Well, let's let's leave Taiwan alone. I mean, that's that's become sort of a hot button. You know, if you saw today in the news, Henry Kissinger said, well, it won't happen for 10 years anyway. You know, so, you know, the, the, but but Hong Kong. Uh, yeah, I think they felt that it was time to to move on Hong Kong after, you know, after two years of protests. It, it was clear to them that the, the two-party 
or the, the two state one, what is it, one, one, one state, two systems wasn't working. Uh, you know, so I think, I think in the mind of the, of the, of the party and in the mind of she, if you will, uh, I think they did see that it was time to, to move on, on Hong Kong. And that's why they did it through the security law, because it, it, it is the most rational way that they saw the only way to quell the, the, the democracy uh, demonstrations was to, to use force. And so, yeah, they what need does to that teach us about China's increased efforts at global economic competition? I, I don't. I don't know that. I, I don't know if I understand the, the connection. I mean, it's aggressiveness. This, this, well, this, it's very aggressive stuff, and and I suggest that their economic policies are also um, ag aggressive. Yeah, but but Hong Kong is consolidating inside China. The 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 economic policies are are more focused on on externalizing some of the, some of the overcapacity and excesses inside the system, and that's and that's what I think is is really part of the motivation of of trying to trying to be aggressive with their economic policy is is that they they need to they need to move some of that. Overcapacity outside of China and and create externalities that allow them to to better gain control internally. I mean, if you want the the the, the primary motivation, of course, is is maintenance of the party dominance in in the system because that's again, I think that's where they see the strength of China is internal coherence, and that's how you maintain inter, inter, internal coherence is you don't allow the Me Too movement to gain any traction. You don't, you don't allow any, any protest or any, any uh, dissent of, of the decisions made. You know, and, and in some respects, you go back to my analogy from, from the uh, old Cold War, you know, and that, that was true in the United States. You didn't have, you didn't really have any dissent. You know, now you, you have, have a, a, a policy in, in both parties, Really, although I, I don't want to make it sound like it's uh, it's equivalent because I don't think it is. I think one side is is worse than the other. But both sides, to some extent, see the other side as the enemy, and, and you know, and and that cannot be helpful when you're trying to compete with someone like China that absolutely dismisses all dissent as as uh, violating the the state principles of of cohesion. Well, it's interesting. You you paint a picture of um, of China as not permitting any divisiveness, and it's true. I mean, everything you hear about China is consistent with that. At the same time, this country has divisiveness in every quarter, in every yeah. every possible way it can possibly have the divisiveness. And um, my understanding is the same thing is happening in Europe, uh, but it's not happening in so much. Well, Russia is able to quell it. And China is able to stamp it out. So, what what does this tell us to say that a, a country has the ability to make a plan, implement the plan on a global basis, get control of things that will enable it to better compete on a global basis, mm -hmm. and quell all mm, disturbances and dissent? Well, that's, I, that's a good recipe, isn't it? That, that is a good recipe, and and. As as Wen Jiabao said, it's it's a it's a great opportunity to do big things, and and so you know I, I think that sort of summarizes the vision that the Chinese leadership has, and and now we need to decide is that really deleterious to our best interests, and and the the knee jerk reaction again the reaction to the inbox when you see them taking control of of the of, of the cobalt resources in the world, the answer is yes. But is it? We don't. I mean, I think I think it, we we really need to learn what is going on in China. We need to understand how that economy works. If you want to, if you want to attack the weaknesses, if you want to be strategic about attacking the weaknesses in that system, assuming you want to, and I, I can understand why the United States and others might think that is useful, then you need to understand how it works. And I think so. That, that's my first point: is is that you really need to understand how that economy works before you start deciding to to throw tariffs against it. You know, which mm. 
you know, is, is contradictory to everything that we've ever believed about uh, collective action in the economy, in, in the economics sphere, you know, so, so what, what Trump did, you know, with, with tariffs and, and the Biden administration hasn't changed it yet. It may not be because it believes that tariffs was the right thing, but it's more inertia than, than it is uh, a commitment to the policy, I think. But, but the fact is, is that that doesn't help us because clearly if we're going to act, we're going to have to figure out how to act collectively with the rest of the world. Now, I don't think, I, I think we're too far past the idea of trying to go to the WTO and say, okay, let's, let's sanction China. But I think what we do need to do is we need to look at the possibility of free trade agreements, of, of, of creating, if, if, I mean, if, if not joining the old uh, comprehensive uh, CTPPP, CP, CTP, Oh, I can't say CCCP. Yeah. yeah, not the CCP, please. But the the comprehensive and, and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's what I'm trying to talk about. Oh, oh, okay. You know, or the old TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and I, yeah. they've made it more complicated for people like me that stumble over long acronyms. Oh, and me too. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So you know, but but the point is, is that if 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 we're not willing to join that, then then at least we need to think about how we're going to act collectively with the rest of the world to to stymie some of the aggressiveness that we see in China. But first, we need to decide what is aggressive and what isn't. I mean, just because just because they're taking cobalt doesn't mean that that that's necessarily bad. Unless we decide cobalt really is a scarce resource that they intend to hoard and prevent other people from using. Yeah. So you know, uh, what what about this? So um, you alluded to the possibility that there there could have been a plan at the time the Chinese were taking over the cobalt in the Congo, but there wasn't. Uh, what what would the plan be? What would the element of that plan be to stop them? I mean, for example, so here's an American company that was into coal, losing money in coal, uh, and had a very valuable asset in, in the Congo and let it go because it needed the cash from the sale. Um, how could the United States have stopped that or changed it or saved that? Uh, would there, what would the plan, the policy be? Um, you know, we have a lot of rules that tell our companies um, not to be acquired by foreign companies, right? Um, but we don't have rules that limit our company's ability to sell their assets outside the United States. Right. Um, I, I think I got that right. And, and so there's a, there's a vacuum there and we maybe we could have filled that vacuum in some way and made it um, somehow incentivize them not to sell the Congo cobalt or um, stop them in some way by, by State Department regulations, who knows what. We didn't do any of that. And so when they needed the money as a, a commercial matter, they took the money. What would we do if we had the, the, the benefit of hindsight on that? Yeah, well, I thought I've been thinking about that since, you know, since we talked yesterday about doing this. And I think what you don't do is what, you, what you're suggesting is that you act like China and, and you underwrite you underwrite companies so that in effect they become state-owned enterprises. Because that's that's sort of what you're suggesting is, is you you underwrite uh, McMoran's bad decisions and 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 basically underwrite them to maintain the, the property that they had in the Congo. And I don't yeah, think certainly that would be one option. Yeah. And I agree that's, with that's, you. That's yeah. one option, but then but then you're then you're playing China's game. Then you're doing the same thing, and and then then it becomes a a, a a competition of wills, and you really are in a zero sum game of of uh, global competition in a in a cold war, in basically an economic cold war, and so I don't think I don't think you do that, but I think what you do is you create some incentives for not not just that company, but you create incentives for people to recognize the value of that property. Because don't forget the 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 the, the second the second mine, uh, Kianfu. What is it, Kian? Uh, no, it's Tr not Tr Trante. Trante. Yeah, Tr Trante. The, the the Trante property was sitting was sitting dormant. I mean, they weren't doing anything with it. 
because because they didn't want to invest the money and and they had so much trouble with the other site that they sold that uh, you know four years that they 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 got out of that because they didn't want to be part of that either you know so so i think what you, what you have to do is you have to create some incentives for them to to basically develop the de develop the technology or develop the, the site so that they can they can mine that cobalt but you i don't don't think what you don't want to do is i don't think you want to be like china and take take the the uh, the opposite approach the, the same approach that china takes to to underwriting these companies because i still think that that's where the potential weakness in the China model lies is is overextending that that state sponsorship, and and I, I, I'm talking I'm thinking specifically about Evergrande or Kaisu, you know, some of these real estate companies that have really overextended their debt, and that's a that's a weakness in that system because because crony capitalism is is no, notorious for for exactly that of, of overextending debt both at the local level in in state owned enterprises and in, in enterprises that are beholden to the state, you know, so I think that's that's where you where you think about how you how you counteract the, the, the system. Well, you know, one thing that could have happened, um, and it would not be state-owned, um, you know, enterprises or um, the China model, but it would be actually the American capitalist model, where the state, through one of its, um, you know, agencies within the administration, comes to Ford Motor Company and says, you know, these guys are thinking about selling their mine in Congo, and you're going to need the product of that mine, and it's going to cost you more if China gets control of two thirds of the world's cobalt. So, hey, why don't you guys, you know, use the conference room at the right and have a meeting um, and see if you can't cut a deal where Ford can, you know, enter into a an output contract, uh, some kind of supply arrangement, and and prepay for the cobalt that uh, the McMoran firm already has. And in that way, we're not a party. The United States is not a party. It's merely making a suggestion that it would be beneficial to both of you and the country if you cut a deal to, um, you know, to support future production out of this mine. Yes, but I, I'm not sure that Ford recognizes the importance of the mine. You know, you know, if you remember in the Times article, in fact, you know, the spokesman from Ford said, oh, this isn't really a problem. We can we can find other alternatives. Uh, you know, we're not we're not wedded to this idea that cobalt is the only answer. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> there goes that economic incentive because sure. they aren't agreeing with you. They see they see alternatives, you know, and and that's again, you know, in hindsight, I think I can easily see where they would have said, well, that's fine. We'll buy it from China. We'll let China do the dirty work of mining that stuff. And, and yeah, their standards aren't quite as good. So a few, a few Africans die. That's okay. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get cheap batteries. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm being, I'm being a little, a little bit crude there, but uh, you know, I mean, I think that there's some thinking like that, that does go on. And, and so, well, well, your your idea sounds sounds somewhat righteous. I, I can see where where it, it would fall through the cracks in in the cynical world that uh, some. Yeah, maybe so. In. Yeah, maybe you have to be cynical. But being cynical, I want to raise one other point that we should discuss. Yeah, and that and that goes to the Belt and Road. It goes to the way China has entered into these um, you know resource markets mm -hmm. in Africa and in Latin America. Um, you know, they've been aggressive and they've been successful in cornering the markets in many, many resources. And that's cer certainly part of their long term plan. However, they're not well liked and they and they right. don't treat people all that well. Um, and they they sort of uh, dump on the local population in many, many ways. It's a it's kind of um, a revisiting colonialism. It's economic colonialism is what they do. And there's nobody telling them no, so they go ahead and do it. No national, international organization is going to stop them, at least not now. And I wonder, Carl, is what they are doing, their style of um, you know, cornering these resources in these continents, these two continents anyway, and probably others, um, is it sustainable? Or over time, is the flaw in their system their their style of um, economic uh, colonialism going to 
going to be sustainable, or is it going to is, or is the flaw going to undermine their effort? Yeah, and I think that's that's exactly the question that we need to respond to, and 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 it's the and it's the the area that we need to take action in is is to start figuring out how strategically we hurry that process up a little bit of, of dissatisfaction with the Chinese. And, and I think that's where that's where real strategy comes to play is, is how, how do we highlight the weaknesses of that system? You know, I mean, if you if you want to if you want to play play the game, you've got to play it on your own terms with your own values and the values of those that are being affected by the deleterious aspects of the China policy. And, there, and those people are out there. You're absolutely right. You know, and, you, and you saw it with, with some of the stories about uh, the, the people who have felt the effects in the Congo. You know, they're, they're not happy with what the Chinese are doing. And, and the same goes for other places where, where the Chinese have moved in and, and done these infrastructure projects that are sort of half done in some cases or done without real benefit to the local populations. You know, and so I think that that's, that's exactly where where we have to look to start countering what's going on. You, you're, not going to, you're not going to beat China head on because, because for the very reasons Wen Jiaobao says, they, they, they have a very, very straightforward planning mechanism uh, and a very centralized decision-making mechanism and, and they can do big things, but it's difficult to do big things well, especially when you overextend yourself. And so that's where that's where the the weakness of the system lies, and that's where you that's where you attack it to to counter it. And then it and then and you and then you're right at what you said when we began the, the session that we're going to be we're going to win in the end because <laughs> because we're we're, we're going to persevere and and be more clever than they are because uh, because we're innovative. This reminds me, Carl, of um, a speaker that you had. Um, two or three times over at the uh, Board of Governors meetings at Pacific Forum. Uh, and he talked, uh, one year he talked about soft power. Uh, he was with the Kennedy School, as I remember. You must remember his name. Yeah, uh, Joe Nye. Joe Nye. Yes, Joseph S. Nye Jr. Yeah. I remember it well. Yeah. Um, and uh, one year he talked about uh, soft power. And then a year or two later, he started talking about something called smart power. And he wrote books and articles about this. And what I, what I hear from you know, your thoughts on this is that we have to be smarter. Um, it's kind of um, smart power to the nth degree, where we figure out how to be the good guy in such a way so that we, um, you know, we, we, we make a great counter to what the Chinese are doing. And, and um, and people will like us better. I, I I couldn't help but noticing that the manager of the mine, of the uh, what's the Tenki mine, yeah. a fellow named Katanga, mm -hmm. uh, didn't want the Chinese to take it over. Right. He was being a whistleblower too, and he's African. Um, mm -hmm. The guy the guy was afraid of what would happen if they took it over, and he was speaking out against it. And the reason is clear: he doesn't like the way they do business. And so we could have friends like Katanga all over the place mm -hmm. uh, using this kind of uh, um, smart power on steroids. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's where we need to get to. And, and, and that's why, you know, we, I, I, we, can't, we can't be like China because then, then you're just choosing the biggest bully in the valley and China's a big bully. Yeah, I think we'll have to leave it there, Carl. Okay. Um, great, great discussion about such a timely topic. Um, it's uh, it's been in the newspapers, and because the newspapers that reported it are the you know original news sources, if you will, did the investigation. Uh, we'll hear more about it in other media, I'm sure, going forward. Yeah. So, thank you for responding with me on this. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to our next discussion about um, what do I say the the follow up. There you go. And what's yeah, going and, on. and there will be a follow up because this is a this is a long term, long term project that uh, that we're undertaking in figuring out how to compete in an effective way with a with a power like China, which, you know, from from the broad 
20,000 foot level looks unstoppable at this point. Yeah, what a challenge. Yeah. What excitement. Thank you, Carl Baker, Pacific Forum. Really appreciate you coming down. Thanks, Jay. Aloha.